It's a pleasure to welcome Stephen Levy and Laura Seidel back to our stage tonight. Stephen Levy is one of the most celebrated and well-known observers of Silicon Valley. He's been an award-winning journalist for more than 20 years, and for us as a contemporary history museum, he's just about the perfect guest. I first encountered Stephen's work in 1993 uh, in a piece he wrote for Wired Magazine, where he is now senior writer. It dealt with cryptography, which I mentioned a moment ago, and the cyberpunk uh, underground of crypto files. One of the chief scientists he profiled, of course, was Whitfield Diffie, and uh, also with Martin Hellman. So uh, that crypto work has long been a fascination of Stevens, and he's one of the best writers on the subject. Uh, but his new book, his seventh book, is In the Plex, How Google Thinks, Works, and Shapes Our Lives. It's a wonderful read, and it's a wonderful read for three reasons. First of all, it's one of Silicon Valley's favorite stories. It's a founder story, uh, and it happens to be one of the most engaging founder stories that I think you'll read because it chronicles one of the most amazing companies of the Internet era. Google is not just a corporation, after all. It is a verb. And it was one of the first internet companies to achieve that distinction. It's brilliant for a second reason. It is an insider story. When you read the book, you'll see that Stephen got a tremendous amount of cooperation in a full and candid way from many, many people who really count at Google, those who were there before the birth, at the birth, and the critically important Googlers who joined shortly after. And to say that they're candid and open is putting it mildly. And it's a great book for a third reason. It is a very well-told tale. Stephen juggles about a thousand different strands in this book. The technical strand, the financial strand, the historical strand, the emotional and people strand. He doesn't sugarcoat it. He doesn't pull any punches. Uh, in the Plex is a straightforward and compelling book. Laura Seidel is NPR's digital culture correspondent. She's becoming a regular in the museum family. She was here last month in conversation with gamer Dr. Jane McGonigal, and she will be the host of our fellow awards at the, at the end of the month. We are always delighted to welcome Laura back to our stage. Let me remind you, you have Q&A cards on your chairs. We'll be collecting those in about an hour and taking your questions that way. Please join me in welcoming Stephen Levy and Laura Seidel. So I guess I'll, I'll just say to begin with, you know, so it's about 15 years ago that a couple of grad students at Stanford set up shop in a dorm room and set something up they called PageRank. Um, and one of them was named Larry Page, pun intended, I believe. Um, and the other one was Sergey Brin. And um, their story is now pretty much the stuff of, of legend. Um, and uh, they pretty much upended the portal business. They showed the world that search was something important, and they had this dream of making all the world's information accessible. And they are continuing on that path, <clears throat> and the path um, that you have laid out in, in an incredibly well-documented book has at times been a tough one <laughs> and gets tougher um, as their dreams sort of hit against, I think, some of the realities of the world. The, the company's tough, not the book, right? Yes. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the, book is, the book is actually, you know, and it's one of these things where I'm so interested mm -hmm. in it. It's always hard for me to tell for sure if everyone will be, but if you were at all interested in it, I found it a, a, a great, fascinating read, and I learned some things about the company. My first question to you, though, I, you have been covering the Valley and technology for a while. Why did you pick Google? as the focus of your latest book? I first came across Google when it was pretty early in its history, and it was just starting to get noticed uh, around the world, really, uh, as a much more effective way to find things on the internet. People thought that search was cured, right? And that uh, it was as good as it was going to get. And then Google came along, and it was something so good that it was different. And it was transformative. It not only could you find what you wanted, but it opened up new frontiers so people could start things knowing they could be found. And I think I had to meet these people because you know, I was excited about it. And just to see, because when new things start out, I always want to know, is this going to be something which is a nice development or something where I really have to know the people behind this company. They're going to matter. They're going to be 
you know, uh, make a difference in our lives. So I went down to the Googleplex as it was then, which was the first bigger building they moved into. And I, I knew the public relations person, uh, uh, Cindy McCaffrey, mm -hmm. from, uh, she was from Apple Computer, I knew her then. And I said, Cindy, I want to meet these guys. It was October mm -hmm. of 1999. And as it happened, it was the Google celebration of Halloween. And Larry was dressed like a Viking in a big fur vest and you know, had a hat with big horns coming out of it. And Sergey was dressed like a cow with these huge, disgusting udders, plastic udders coming out. And the cow and the Viking took me into a room and described page rank to me. And uh, there was something about them which was compelling. And I thought, and as it grew to an important company and then had this IPO and it turned out to be an incredibly successful business, I thought this, this could be worth a book. At that time, there were a couple books going on it. Right. And I thought I'd, I'd let them go, you know, and I went to something else. But I felt there was something about this company which was not only different in what it gave us, but different on its own terms. The ethos and I, of it, you felt and it was different. really hit home for me in the summer of 2007 when I was invited to go along with some young Google managers. They have a program called Associate Product Managers, who are really the future leaders of Google. They are people who are paid uh, to be not only skilled in an engineering sense, but an entrepreneurial sense as well. And every summer, uh, Marissa Mayer, one of the you know, you know, key executives of Google, takes these young leaders, these, these uh, product managers, uh, to visit Google offices around the world. And I was invited to go along on this trip. We literally went around the world to Tokyo, Beijing, Bangalore, and Tel Aviv. And I spent 24-7 with those people, unmediated, which was sort of a rare experience for a journalist. And inside the company, I realized it was much more interesting than I thought. It was not just all those things I said before, but there was a, a cultural movement going on there, that, that these people were steeped in, in the future in a way that the predecessors in the business hadn't been. And you know, I got a sense of what their values were, and I later learned that they were really directly channeled from Sergey Brin and especially Larry Page. And I thought, wouldn't it be amazing to tell the story of Google as much as possible from the inside, mm -hmm. to get that experience I had with this group of 18 engineers for, with the company of 20,000 people as it was then. And I thought if I could write that book, that could be something. And that's what I tried to do. Well, you certainly did get inside. And I wondered a couple things. And we're going to get on to what you saw on the inside in a minute. But first, how long did it take you to actually do this? And how much access were you actually given to Google in the process? I, I started the book in, a, in you know, a pretty intense matter in June 2008. Um, so it was almost three years. And uh, I asked for a lot of access. Basically, the most important thing was to be able to talk to anyone I wanted to talk to. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to sit in on a number of meetings, events, other things that go on there. But mainly, it was talking and talking again. I wanted to talk to the people at Google, not just Larry and Sergey and Eric, but the people who you never heard of who were key to Google. The, you know, there was a, a number of people, as it turns out, inside of Google who were very important in developing its products. They were superstars, but they were unknown to ev everyone else. And they were influential in the company. And sometimes they were just wonderfully strange. And these were the people I wanted to spend time with. And not just once, but sometimes multiple times. And, mm -hmm. and my time at Wired, actually, the same month I started serious work on this book, I began full time at Wired magazine. I left Newsweek and uh, shifted to Wired, though, uh, as John mentioned, I've been writing for Wired for quite a, quite a, quite a long time as, as a freelancer. And it was a terrific synergistic experience uh, that I was able to sometimes spin off articles. With, with Google's permission, you know, because mm -hmm. basically everything I did inside of Google was for the book, unless we had mutual con consent uh, otherwise. Um, and that would help me. Can I just interrupt for a minute? Because didn't, didn't Sergey say to you, why, don't you, why are you releasing a book? Why, why don't you just release right. little chapters mm -hmm. at a time? Um, yeah, there, there's a paradox here. Maybe we'll talk about the book 
uh, Google book search later on, but it's a company that, that takes books very, very seriously as a corpus of information, but the two founders you know, aren't really book people in terms of their own preferences there. And uh, you know, when Sergey said that, 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 that to me, uh, he had said it to another book writer earlier, I, I, I remembered uh, reading, and I thought, you know, he, he, it, it doesn't have the same seriousness. And sometimes, uh -huh. you know, working on a Wired article, he would spend a little more time with me. He, spent, he never spent as much time as he did at Newsweek in the early days, of course. We'd come to New York and we'd have lunch, or, uh, you know, uh, and he was much more accessible. Google would come out with a new product and it would be Sergey on the phone telling you about it, or you call up on an issue, and they'd say, "Hold on, Sergey wants to get on the phone." And uh, you know, in later years, and maybe we can talk about that too. Larry yeah. and Sergey were, were were tougher gets, but you know, that, well, they're bigger, they, yeah, they're busier, yeah. I'm sure, right? But you know, uh, obviously, I, you know, uh, we I'd run into them all the time at, at the Googleplex there. Yeah, I, I just thought that was funny that that's what he said to you in the process of this. So a couple of years, you were there a lot. They gave you access to all kinds of people. You didn't feel at all like they were really guarding access to you. I mean, it seems like yeah. the things you talk about in the book, they do feel like you really are talking about things in a very factual way, moments, scary moments, whatever. They, they really gave you access to these well, things. Well, an interesting thing happened. Well, one thing that I didn't mention before is I had access to a number of projects at Google that were not public yet, mm -hmm. so in, well in advance. And this was something that even happened on that trip there. During that trip, uh, one thing they did was they went to every office. They would explain to the engineers of that office. Here's what we're up to in Mountain View, and the engineers in that office, whether it was in Bangalore or Tokyo or, or Haifa, you know, would say, and here's what we're doing here. And you know, one of the things that the uh, engineers at Mountain View talked about was this product called Chrome, this browser they were working on. And that, that was a year away. So they knew that they could trust me to keep my mouth shut uh, and not pre-announce products there. But knowing about a lot of things that were going on in Google that weren't public opened up a level of trust because people can talk to me about something which wasn't public. I think they came to feel that they could unburden in other things. And I also have to give Google a lot of credit. When, and a lot of times I'd be in an interview and there would be a communications person in the room, you know, more often than not, and they, sometimes they would look over at the person, you know, of Karen Wickery, who's out, out in the audience, who's most often that person. They'd say, can we say this? And, <laughs> and she'd say, be frank, be frank, go ahead. Uh, and, and they did. And after a certain amount of time, I remember I was talking to Eric once, and he was asking, how's it going, you know, before we uh, went into our interview. And I said, it's funny. It's like learning to play guitar at a certain point. Uh, you stop looking down at where your fingers are on the chord and you just play the music. And that's the way I felt at a certain point when I was at, at Google. I felt very much at home there. And the people, I think, picked up on that when I, when I interviewed them. And within a few minutes, we were talking, not so much with the distance of a journalist and a source, but almost as if, in some sense, we were collaborators or colleagues. I mean, my experience there has largely been that they have been relatively open as companies go, especially compared to Apple, but that's a different story. That's a different story. <laughs> um, you know, one of the things, let's go to sort of where the, the book, uh, some of the early parts of the book, um, and one of the things that you actually make quite a point of saying is that both these guys went to Montessori schools, and, and that actually understanding that is, is kind of key to understanding this company in terms of how they think. Mm. Um, I mean, you had some, some really interesting thoughts about the kind of freedom that they experienced in well, these actually schools, right? I read uh, Maria Montessori's works uh, <laughs> to better understand them. And it, it was really interesting because it talked about the balance of what freedom of dis and discipline. And it really seemed to map out a lot of the perceived philosophy of Larry and Sergey in what employees should be able to do. It's almost a liberating thing not to have to answer to authority and say what you do next. So maybe the, 20, the famous 20% projects at Google. And right, these are, they, you have 20% of your time to work on something you're just excited about, right? Right, and right, and sometimes people call it the 120% because they have to do all their work <laughs> anyway. 
and then they get to do 20% mm -hmm. uh, of, of things they want to do by themselves. But that seems very much in keeping with the Montessori philosophy. Right. Yeah. And for Lowry and Sergey themselves, they pursue this within the structure of Google. And I think it's very important for them to be free radicals inside the Google system, that they don't want to be pinned down too much, to the point where, at one time, they dismissed their assistants. They had a, a group of uh, young women who were their assistants. They were called uh, L LSA, Lowry Sergey Assistants. People would talk to them as if it was an entity. They'd say, I'll ask LSA if, you know, if Sergey could come to this or something like that. And Lowry explained to me that he just didn't like the idea that someone could say yes to a meeting for him. And they ended the assistance, and, and that was it. You know, from, from there on, they were free to roam and go wherever you wanted. And it had some interesting uh, effects on how Google employees who wanted to talk to them would have to find them. Right, which, you know, well, I, I hope that LSA's stocks had vested by the time they were let go. <laughs> um, I think seems, they went to other places. Oh, yeah, so it, it seems, though, yeah. that you, is, there's that management style. The other thing that struck me is the, the actual sort of development of the core ideas behind Google, their ability to, as it were, think out of the box, which is sort of a cliche term at this point, their ability to constantly ask, well, why should it be that way? You know, for example, in advertising, the development of AdSense. Um, on every level, it seems like these two guys, something at their core is always saying, well, why should it have to be that way? Right, and you know, uh, you know, the advertising system, uh, AdWords was the first product, and really, it is the signal product of the internet age in, in terms of making money. You know, there's no product in the, in the internet which is done as well as Google AdWords, but it's even better than that because it is a, a product, an advertising product that people want to see. And how do we know they want to see it? Google, being Google, tests everyone, and they find out they want to see it. They give a certain percentage, they do this regularly. They still might be doing it. Sometimes you might go to the Google search engine and see no ads, and that wouldn't be because no one bought the keywords, but you're part of a test. Every time you use Google, actually, I found you are part of a test, which blew my mind, right? right. Uh, we could talk about that a little later, but in this case, they, people search more when there's ads. Therefore, they're happier, they want the ads. And the reason why those ads are so successful is that even though it's an auction system, the highest bidder doesn't win. It's the, the bid is modulated by how useful the ad is, how much people want to see it. So they build the ad quality into the system to make it useful to the advertiser. And that's an ideal that they managed to meet and I thought it was a great triumph. Well, it's, it's, it seems like at one point in the book you actually talk about Google sort of thinks of things as sort of a troika where it's not just the advertiser you know, and Google, it's, it's the person who is seeing the ads, which in many ways this is kind of different from the way people thought about advertising before. So the, Google wants the ads to actually be useful to you. And this, this, was, this whole way this worked, didn't it upset a lot of people in the traditional advertising community? Well, very much so. And, and largely what, what upset them is the idea was so measurable, because it's all based on measurement. You have to measure it in order to know how good the ads are, how useful they are. And as a result, the science in Google's ad system is just as sophisticated as the science in Google's search engine. And that's why they have so many statisticians and economists and, uh, and mathematicians working on, on the ad side as uh, well as they have you know, engineers and computer scientists and artificial intelligence specialists working on the search side. I mean, it, it's, you know, uh, it, it's the death of madmen. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, this sort of mystery, I think, is my mic working there? So, yes. Okay. It's, it's sort of the death of mystery, as you say, in, right. in advertising, because you can really know, and they've figured it out mathematically, you can really know whether or not an ad is useful to somebody. Right, and I had a lot of fun actually talking to some of the people on the ad side. Usually when you read an article about Google, you, you don't see anything about salespeople. But to me, it was fascinating how the salespeople at Google, and Google still does need salespeople, even though Larry at one point asked, why do we have these people? <laughs> uh, they changed their role from sitting out over dinner and negotiating something and co convincing a client to uh, take an ad out or an agency to get a client to take an ad out to almost being uh, 
your guide into saying how you buy these keywords and, and what you do there. And, you know, uh, and that would change when they moved away from paying for ads per impression, how many people saw it, to how many people clicked on it. And it was all taken care of, and it was all measurable. So it, it changed that role dramatically. And some people uh, in the ad department thought, whoa, where, where are we going here? when we're no longer saying we're definitely going to get this money. We have a pretty good thing going here. I think Google was making some, some nice money before they switched to that system there. Uh, but Google took a deep breath and implemented this system, and it turned out to be way more successful than anything we'd seen before. Didn't they even get thrown? Was it General Motors who threw some of their ad people out at one point? Just right, sort of yeah. Said, like, well, 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 you know, What's wrong with you guys? Well, people thought, well, even, even before that, you know, just the idea of, of seeing these search ads, uh, people thought that this was ridiculous. We, we can't, we can't get, get, get involved with that. This isn't real advertising. This isn't the way things work there. Uh, and Google had a difficult time convincing people that buying keywords that show up in these little blocks of text were appropriate advertising vehicles for a, a big corporation. Uh, but when they started to point out that some huge number, 90% or something, of people who buy a car go online to research their purchase, then even General Motors figured out this is something we should get involved in. So these guys, they, they come in, they're very unconventional. I'd like to, you, you told one story, and I think this was a serious story. They were talking about how to do transactions in countries that didn't have credit cards, and uh, Larry Page said, well, we could, we could take goats in Uzbekistan. Uh, <laughs> So you have these very unconventional guys, and the people who funded Google, the VCs, said, you know, we want a grown-up to come in. And this is when Eric Schmidt comes into the company, and um, he, for many years, I guess about 10, w was the quote-unquote grown-up in, in the company. How did they pick Eric? Well, as you mentioned, the venture capitalists that put $25 million into Google in 1999 did it with the expectation that these two young men from Stanford, with no experience managing a giant company, would get what was what's called in the Valley adult supervision and hire an experienced manager to be the CEO. Just because you dress like a cow when you show <laughs> reporters things, I don't know why you need an adult, right? Uh, there's, there's some interesting April Fool's videos of Eric at Sun. <laughs> it shows he, he, he got some fun too. But uh, a few months after they got the money, they called John Doerr and said, we've changed our mind. We think we could run this company ourselves. And John, he told me his first instinct was to say, I'm out of here. But he held back and said, wait a minute. Why don't you just do this? Why don't you go and talk to a number of CEOs? some of the companies in the Valley that you respect. And I'll set up this tour. So they went on what I call the magical mystery tour of the best CEOs, which would include Jeff Bezos and Steve Jobs and you know, all, of, all, the, all the greats. So they came back from the tour and they said to John, you know, you're right, we like having a CEO and we know just the person who could be our CEO, Steve Jobs. <laughs> He was otherwise engaged at Yeah, he was a little busy, and I don't know if he was going to uh, do that. But John finally got them to look at, at Eric. And there was a number of reasons why they respected Eric. He, he had his technical chops, and he had written a program that, that they liked. And, uh, but Eric also was smart enough to know that he couldn't go in there and say, I'm the adult, I'm going to run the thing, step aside, and let me make the decisions. Instead, he adopted a very conscious, it seemed to me, stance of, at every point, and I heard this a lot, just talking about how brilliant Larry and Sergey were. Uh, you know, and he would talk about how much he learned from Larry and Sergey. And you know, Eric would do the things at, at Google that helped make it an effective corporation, but he yielded some of his autonomy. There was this Troika system where on some important matters, two out of three voted. And you could say that in certain respects, Larry and Sergey were a block in that voting structure. Eric was successful in sometimes in uh, slowing down 
some things that Larry and Sergey wanted to do right away. For instance, the browser we mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, Larry and Sergey wanted to do that earlier. And Eric was very concerned about Microsoft noticing how well Google would, was doing, right. noticing how, what a good field search was. And he didn't want to moon the giant, as he said. Uh, and Eric, in Eric's history, Microsoft was a big, scary company. He didn't want to take them on. He had lived through the browser wars. That hadn't ended too well for Netscape, on whose side he was rooting. So he slowed that down. But Larry and Sergey, they look ahead. They don't worry about who's in a space that they think is interesting for Google to go. They just go. They just dive in. So it was an interesting dynamic that Eric was able to sometimes stave off their impulses and sometimes not. But sometimes, and Eric would be the first to admit this, he would say, you know what, I thought we shouldn't do that, and I was wrong. Yeah. And it was a number of things, like going in and bidding a lot of money to get the AOL business in search, which was actually very important for Google. Uh -huh. Yeah, he, well, he, it seems like for many years he was able to navigate that, and um, perhaps in, in, in confronting Microsoft, that may have been you know, a wise decision. I, I, um, I wanted to ask um, about something in the book that I did not know, which is that Google is one of the largest computer manufacturers in the world. This, this was fascinating to me. I had no idea. And then when you explained why, I was like, oh, of course. And I'm, I'm thinking probably that may surprise people here as well. Explain why it is Google is one of the largest computer makers in the world. Well, one, one of the things that I really wanted to do in the book was talk about the data centers at Google. And that's really one of the biggest secrets there. And I was lucky in a couple ways in learning about it. And one was they were getting a little more open than they used to be. Not open enough to say, Stephen, come to a data center and explore it. But as it turned out, during an early story for Newsweek, I had gone to one of Google's data centers when they were leasing space in a co-location center uh, not far from here. But there were some ex-employees who were uh, a little more verbose about the data centers. <laughs> and then there were some publications, scientific publications that Google had, which were available that you could learn. So you could piece together something there. And people always talk about how many computers Google has, how many servers they have. And they build them themselves. And no one really knows the number. At a certain point, they stop telling you. And then they admitted 100,000. They said, OK, you could say that. And it was probably much more. Mm -hmm. Then the number sort of stopped at a million. But Google's much bigger. So really, no, no one knows how much it is. But a million really is the, is, is the baseline there. There's many, many. I, I guess the, the question is, why are they building their own? Why, why did they build their own rather than go and buy them from, say, Dell or something? You know, what, what was? The it, in it's cheap. It's cheap it is the reason. And frugality mm -hmm. is part of, of Google's success, particularly in that. When you talk about millions of computers, cost is, is a big problem. And they do an interesting thing with those computers there. Other companies might think, you know what, we're going to not be um, uh, penny wise and pound foolish. We're going to buy the good equipment that doesn't break down. Google takes the opposite approach. They say, we're going to buy the crappiest equipment and sometimes tweak it so it gets a little better. But we're going to operate a system so it's built for failure. It's easy to deal with it when a, a, one, of the, one of the servers goes down. We could swap it out really quickly. And they found out that in the long run, that stands them much better. And in, in a way, Google is the most successful failure system that's ever invented. Uh, they build in the redundancy. Their software system, and, and it's extremely innovative, uh, is really built to handle failure very, very successfully. And you could argue maybe that in the way they roll out products, some of that goes out too. They, their system is built to handle failure in products. They figure if you're not failing in a certain amount of products, you're not trying hard enough. Well, that may be, I mean, you know, for example, Gmail was in beta for five years, I think. Yeah. Right? <laughs> You, you, so that it could just, they could just keep, it, and it was only in beta, we haven't really or released it, I guess. Right. I, I think I mean, Google single-handedly destroyed the term beta, <laughs> made it meaningless. I, I, I think it's sort of like Spider-Man in, in New York City being in previews for, I don't know, <laughs> yes. right? They, they keep doing that. Um, Talk about failure, yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, 
you know, artificial intelligence is also, and, and I think as, as the company got bigger and moved along, or the, they started to realize increasingly more and more that they had to be involved in artificial intelligence. And I always say, in the book, you mentioned something too about how uh, Larry said, well, we'd just like to install little search <laughs> engines in everyone's brain. Um, but they, yeah. haven't, they haven't quite done yeah. that. But no, it was kind of funny. Every year, no. Google has these elaborate April Fool's thing. And I notice how closely the fantasy, over-the-top subjects of their April Fool's jokes are things that Larry and Sergey really want to make happen. <laughs> you know, they talk about these artificial intelligence systems will do this for you and do that for you. And maybe a, a self-driving car would have been April, an appropriate April Fool's joke early in Google's history, and now they're building them, right? So, uh, and you say an increasing reliance on artificial intelligence. It was always there. Hmm. I went back to some of my very early interviews with Larry and Sergey, and they were going on at length about artificial intelligence very, very early in their history. And as it turns out, as the search engine evolved, artificial intelligence learning became more and more a factor in that. Everyone knows about PageRank, is what you say. Well, not everyone, but people who associate Google, they learned about in the earlier days. Mm -hmm. They said, well, the search engine is fantastic because it relies on this democracy of the web. What people think is important on the web is what Google identifies as important for a search. And that was a, a huge breakthrough, and it helped Google rise above the crowd there. But as Google's search engine evolved, it drew its power from learning. It learns from the data that people give it when they react to the search engine. So all those clicks you do, when you go to a search engine, you choose a result, or maybe you say, this doesn't work, I'm gonna put it in another term. This is information that Google uses to find out if you're happy. And Google learns about the world from that. If you swap in one word for another word in your search query, then Google thinks, hmm, maybe those words are kind of similar. Let me look at behavior of other people. So Google learns synonyms that way. And by the same process, Google learns languages by having a, a corpus of documents that they use that have translated text from one to another. It can learn by, by the same algorithms you know, how language works, and that's how Google translates work, where it works. So more and more, you could see how artificial intelligence really is integral to what Google does. And I think you know, there's a number of things you could say, Google is an X company, Google's a Y company, Google is a technology company, Google is an internet company. Google, I think, is an artificial intelligence company as well. Well, I think in using it, I, I'm seeing it more and more, how much it, it continues to guess at things. But this is also where perhaps they're gonna start to increasingly get in trouble and have, which is how much information they have about people and how they're using it. And I know, and, and the sort of conflict, it seems like, between what they're trying to do, which is really guess what you want before you even know what you want. Right. They are really, really trying hard there's, there's to a term, know. There's a term called zero query search at Google. <laughs> That's a little frightening, actually. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, you know, the culture of Google, it had for a long time this very experimental sense and still has it. So in the years you've been covering it, my question is, as it's grown, there's 24,000 people now. Do you still feel that when you go there? Do you still feel some sense of like, this is an experimental place where, you know, you can see a guy dressed as the CEO dressed as a cow, you know? Well, it's sort of taken for granted now, a lot of these things. And I think maybe April Fool's is going as far as, as you could take it now. You know, uh, there's an April Fool's infrastructure at Google. That, <laughs> there's design, and people work for months at, at these things there. So you could say it, it's clever, it's part of the culture, but it's not so spontaneous anymore. And I think you could say, as, as a lot of things get, these things become institutionalized okay. and people get used to them. But it's still rather remarkable. You don't see it adopted outside of Silicon Valley a lot, mm -hmm. uh, the things that they do at Google. Inside Silicon Valley, you see now startups, even Twitter, when you visited Twitter in its very early days, they had lifted a, a lot of the amenities that Google has and had it even in, in, a, in a small startup there. So I think that in some senses, people think it's a good idea. It's a good idea to feed your employees. They don't leave the campus uh, during the day and they're happier and happier employees maybe are less likely to be resentful employees. 
I, a lot of companies don't think that way, but Google always has. I, I want to actually switch, though, to, okay, culture of innovation. They bought YouTube because they could not themselves, they knew video was going to be important to the web. They clearly saw that coming. But they couldn't, when they started with Google Video, they couldn't quite hit on the formula. Mm -hmm. And it was outside the company that happened. They bought YouTube. Right. Um, so I guess a couple things. One is, you think that was a good acquisition? Two, um, do you think that it was a sign that the company was perhaps less innovative than it had been? I think it is definitely a sign that Google, as a bigger company, can't operate as nimbly and as freely as it could when it was small. And you can see that. And actually, the YouTube thing uh, is a great example of that, because as it turns out, there is an amazing method by which you can compare the way Google Video, Google's product, was developed and the way YouTube was developed because there was a big lawsuit that came it was with the Viacom yes. filed against Google and YouTube where all the emails from both sides came out. And you could see from the Google side, there were all these emails. Basically, what the managers of Google Video spent a lot of their time doing was preparing presentations to their bosses and talking to lawyers to make sure that they weren't going to do something to get them in trouble, to be, there would be too much infringing content. And on the other side, here were these very few people at YouTube, and their email said, who cares? Let's just put the stuff out and get eyeballs. Let's, you know, let, let's just go for it there. And YouTube became much more successful than the much better supported and uh, certainly you know, more resource-heavy uh, Google product there. And Google realized this, to its credit, and overpaid for, they, you know, Eric Schmidt admitted they overpaid for YouTube. But at this point, I actually think it looks like a pretty darn good purchase. YouTube is, I think, the premier video franchise of the web. Google doesn't say whether it's profitable, but Clearly, they, they have say, said that it's, it's making sizable revenues, mm -hmm. and I think it's poised to make more. I think they have very ambitious plans for it, that it could have a much bigger impact on our lives than, than even the considerable impact it has already. I, I guess the question, the question is, yes, when will it make a profit? There's more, com more and more competition from things like Hulu, Vimeo, so it, as in many other areas that Google's facing right now, there's just a lot more competition. But there's incredible advantages that Google has. We mentioned those data centers. Google is able to operate a video franchise at a much lower cost than its competitors. Building those data centers like that, you know, they, Google gets a huge savings advantage. They're, they, they redesign the way data centers work. Mm -hmm. They own fiber in the ground. They, they're probably the biggest owner of fiber optic cable in the world. And so it costs less for Google to do these things than other companies. And a few years ago, when some of these analysts were saying, oh, they, they must have spend $800 million a year just on bandwidth, uh, that was wrong. Google people didn't tell me exactly how much they did pay, mm -hmm. but it was clear to me that those estimates were way over the top. Hmm. So. I want to I want to get to a, a few things about where Google is now, um, and I, I want to talk about China, which you bring up in the book. And China is an interesting, you know. We haven't yet said "Don't be evil," which is, of course, Google's unofficial corporate motto that they came up with earlier, I guess, in sort of a little session. They needed to come up with kind of a motto, right? Right, right. That was Paul Buckheit. Uh, uh, an early Google engineer who was sitting in this meeting. He thought it was getting kind of Dilbert-esque. It was a meeting of values where someone was, you know, human relations was writing these things on a whiteboard and people were saying, you know, be kind and, uh, and you know, uh, help customers and things like that. And he just thought, why don't we just say don't be evil and get it over with, you know? And uh, even though the uh, person running the meeting tried to say, well, that seems kind of negative. Maybe we could spin that more positively, but uh, another engineer, uh, almost like Kilroy was here, when he was writing on the whiteboards of Google, and it, and it caught on. And it turned out to be sort of a useful way mm -hmm. to establish a sense of what's the right thing, not only for customers, but for us here at Google, and for the world at large. And 
Larry and Sergey always said they wanted Google to be good for the world at large, and they said it in their IPO, that sometimes we're even going to sacrifice profit to do the right thing for humanity. What a thing to say when you're asking people to invest in your company to make money on their investment. Now, of course, that was always, I think somebody, one of their early PR people always was like, oh, do you really want to say that? Because it's, it's a difficult value to uphold for any profit-making enterprise. <laughs> Ultimately, yeah. you are going to run up against those conflicts, right? Right, Where yeah. Well, if you're a, a, a communications person at Google, uh, and you hear this statement, don't be evil, and you watch in horror as it moves from sort of a he secret hand sh handshake inside the company to something that, that, that gets out, you could just see it's going to be used as a bludgeon against the company later yeah. on. But I was surprised that a lot of people at Google, even though it is sort of the knee-jerk way to get at Google, oh yeah, don't be evil, you, you point, they do this, they do that, and they say, you know, people use it against right. them. Yeah, no, you are the guys who's supposed to. You're just to, a bunch of profit, you're just making yeah. profit, you know, yeah, that, that kind of. But the people at Google I talk to, even though they may not say it a lot, they, they insist it's been a useful mm -hmm. phrase and standard and way of thinking for them. They don't regret it. Now, around China, it created fights with, within the company and among the ruling Troika, um, where I think Sergei was not so sure. Sergei, who came from the Soviet Union, um, saw what that kind of regime was like as a child, was very uncomfortable going into China. And they had, they had to weigh this. And it sounds like, you know, from what you gathered, they weighed this very hard. This was a difficult, everything they did there from the get-go was a difficult decision. Right, I spent a lot of time on the, the, the China issue and went to China uh, a couple times. And I was fascinated to see, and I, I saw a little of this at Newsweek, I was covering that uh, at Newsweek and actually attended the famous hearing in Congress where you know, uh, Tom Lantos, the only uh, Holocaust survivor ever to serve in Congress, uh, made you know, Elliot Schreg representing Google and other people from other companies asked them, are you ashamed because you're, you're going in there and censoring? But they actually did a very careful analysis, and it's tough to say how much they were aware of the implications when they made their decision, but they constructed what was sort of like a moral spreadsheet, right? And then in the spreadsheet, there's all these cells, there's all these you know, numbers there, and some of them were numbers that were in the red. You know, it's a loss that we have to censor. But then there are a lot of numbers who are in the black, saying, well, we're going to pr bring more information into China. Mm -hmm. We're going to open China up. Mm -hmm. In the long run, this compromise we make will be overweighted, overwhelmed by the good that we bring. And on balance, when you crank up all the cells in the spreadsheet, we're in the black. We're doing more good than harm. That's what they figured would happen. But it wasn't that easy. No, I, I mean, I will say, I was in China interviewing somebody who ended up, um, a dissident who ended up in, in prison, and he actually said to me personally that he was happy the American companies were there. So the, the, it definitely is that issue of whether to be in China or not is complex. It's, I don't think it's a straightforward issue, but ultimately they have pretty much pulled back. What was it, you know, I, I gather there was a big breach. What was it about this security breach that occurred that made them finally say, forget it, we're just going to be in Hong Kong, we, we're not playing the Chinese game anymore. Well, to understand what happened with the security breach, you have to look back to all the things that happened before. And as it turned out, the experience of Google in China had been sufficiently troublesome that a lot of people who signed on to that spreadsheet idea, to that you know, idea that Google was going to do more good than harm, had come to the conclusion that it isn't working. And we should think about changing our minds on this. And there were a significant number of people in the executive suites of Google, I guess they're not executive suites, but executive cubicles or whatever you want to call them, who were in a low key way sort of arguing that, that we should re re rethink this. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just Sergey, it, w it was some other really key people. And th things weren't working. And there were a number of tensions from China, the China side. There were a lot of people very unhappy with the support or lack of it they felt mm -hmm. they were getting from Mountain View. Mm -hmm. uh, there were, the biggest issue in China, I was surprised when I spent a week interviewing people uh, in Beijing, that the biggest problem among the Chinese engineers was nothing, had nothing to do with censorship. It was that they were not allowed access to Google's code base in order to work on the products and improve them, 
just like the engineers in the United States and every other international off, uh, office were. They couldn't get access to those. And, you know, and they said they felt that Google didn't trust them. And I talked to one executive at Google, and he said, well, actually, that's the case. <laughs> because we don't want to put them in a position where their families might be at risk, or there could be someone in the Communist Party. We don't know. And that's the way we're going to play it. And I, ironically, it turned out that a security violation was what many Googlers described to me as the straw that broke the camel's back. Yeah. It was, I mean, and it was pretty bad. I mean, they got access to code. And what, what was it about that, though, that, that tipped them over the edge? I'm, I'm sure there were still people who were saying, you know, stay, you're doing more good by bringing your technology here. And some of the people who worked with them uh, felt that way. They felt abandoned. It, within China itself, um, the public in general was saying, you weren't doing that well here anyway, though I say if you have, what, 20, 25% of the Chinese search market, that's huge. But, you know, there were a lot of right. things and going they, And around. they did that, overcoming a, you know, a lot of obstacles there. Right, you know, that, right. You know, uh, but, but I think what happened was that, from Sergei's point of view, much worse than the very, very serious theft of some of Google's best intellectual property, and I don't know what that is. Google's never really said exactly what it is, but we know it was pretty important, was the idea that whoever broke in there, and you'd have to think it was the Chinese government or someone supported by the Chinese government, whoever broke in there was targeting the emails of the, the Gmail accounts right. of dissidents, you know, Chinese dissidents, right. you know, who were using Gmail, which was offshore, right. to talk you know, and, and organize protests or post on them, you know, or just do their personal business there. Uh, and that, by all accounts, infuriated Sergey. He took it very personally, and I think his history resonated, and he, he said that. And that was a, a terrible thing for him and for Google, really. And there's, mm -hmm. there was one uh, person whose account was uh, compromised who was actually at Stanford. And, right. yeah, and Google wanted to get her laptop right away to see if they could see what the, the evidence, how this thing worked there. And they sent their head of security over to Stanford to pick up the laptop. But the, the break-in was so sophisticated that it, it, it evaporated, like you know, the Mission Impossible, the, the self-destruct. And it, it was gone by the time they got her laptop. I mean, it's, there is a lot of cynicism about Google's pullout uh, within China and what it was about, and among some in the press, and, and I actually, had discussions with many people who really feel it was an economic decision, and that's why Google pulled out, and they were looking for an yeah. excuse. I don't, I don't think that at all. I think Google was making incursions yeah. e economically. There were people at Google who came to believe that there was a ceiling to how successful they could be. But as you say, 30% of that market is, is pretty good. And the other thing, I think that the real loss economically for Google is that while their Android phone system uh, is doing well, is making inroads in China. The value to Google of that is much lower because Google gives that system away, but the system works very well with Google products and the Google search engine. So if you're using uh, an Android phone in China and your search engine is Baidu or Bing, that's not much good to Google. No, cert certainly not. I, you know, th the other thing I notice now, tell me, I I'm going to be slightly cynical about it, although I, I am inclined to believe Sergey really had strong feelings and the company had strong feelings about it, but I noticed I saw an article about Facebook doing explorations uh, in talking to the Chinese, and shortly thereafter I saw it, like, and I, I intuitively had a feeling <laughs> it was going to happen, somebody from Google, Google saying, well, we didn't really say we were out of China. And well, this, no, they, the no, actually, they're, they're, they are very emphatic saying, they are not out of China. They still right. have engineers there. Some of their products, like Maps, are, are still doing OK there. Yeah. But I think, to me, the search is the heart of Google. And if that's gone, they have huge obstacles. Yeah. I, well, I guess that, that gets me slightly to, I guess, well, get, moves me forward to the question I wanted to ask now. As we move forward, the company is facing increasing competition um, from Facebook, um, and it's had a you know, this is where the, the beauty of Google has been this extraordinary engineering and intelligence. And Facebook comes along, which is much more, it is about engineering and intelligence, but it's much more social. 
and much more geared uh, towards things that I don't, I, I wonder, are Sergey and Larry going to be good at this? They had the opportunity early on to really get into the social space. Orchid, you know, they really, they didn't take it. Is that saying something going forward about a real trouble area for the, co the company moving forward? Can Larry, mm -hmm. will Larry now taking charge, is he really a grown up? Can he really mm -hmm. do it? Uh, can he move, you know, move them through mm -hmm. this period and compete with yeah. Facebook? Right, well, it's interesting. People talk about this thing as if, you know, the people in Facebook, you know, are touchy-feely kind of people. Uh, they're engineers, too. Oh, I don't believe in right, touch. Yeah. I just that they seem to have a yeah, better, yeah. It's, it's sort of like, well, they, you know. It might be a generational thing because, you know, certainly, you know, it, you think about it, Mark Zuckerberg is, is in the Internet as a full generation younger than Larry and Sergey. We talk to them as, as mm -hmm. young men, but they are men of their late 30s now or, right. you know, get, getting you know, uh, towards, towards 40. They're not, they're not there yet. Uh, and, you know, they're certainly of CEO age, you know, Larry is, and, uh, but I think the question is really, you know, whether Google can successfully integrate those products in, into, its, into its core there. I think now they understand how important it is. In their previous earlier efforts, like Orkut, they didn't treat that with the same priority as, certainly as they're treating it now, but you, know, you, you saw as Facebook became more and more successful, uh, Facebook, I guess, mooned the giant, Google. And now Google has its attention focused you know, very keenly on this area there. And Google has some assets to bring to bear. They know a lot about the people who use it. Uh, they know a lot about your contacts. We just saw a product called Plus One that was announced that's going to try to figure out uh, who you know. That'll see, when you search for something, you'll see if one of the folks in your social circle likes one of the results that came up on your search page. So there's things to bear. So I think Google is committed now, and I think Larry is committed to this product here. So we'll see how it does. Well, and, and I think the other company that in some ways can be a threat to them is Apple. Um, which is probably, of any company, the smartest about how users use things. I went to a party once. I was trying a, an iPhone 4 and a Droid X, mm -hmm. and somebody looked at me and they said, oh, it's kind of like bringing someone from Google and someone from Apple to a party. <laughs> the, the iPhone is better at parties, you know? It's kind of, it's, it's this much more user-friendly device, and so this is, Android, however, is doing incredibly well, I wonder, will that change now that you can get a, a Verizon iPhone? I don't know, you know, how, how well do you think, that, you know, they're, they're equipped to kind of move forward and be a little bit more savvy about how they deal with uh, the public? They've never been good at, for example, you know, when they rolled out the Nexus um, mm. and they had no, con nobody could call up and say, my right. phone isn't working. And, and Larry was a little like, well, let them eat cake. Yeah, talk to yeah, each well, other, I mean, you know. Well, their view of com computer uh, customer support has always been people can figure it out on their own. And actually, at one point, uh, I tell a story where someone was, was figuring out how many more people in customer support they should ask Larry for. And he said, well, why do we need it at all? And you know, he figured out that they'd start these Google forums where people can help each other. It's almost like leaving them on a desert island and saying, you know, figure out how to make your own house there. You know, and you, uh, the manual is, is somewhere in the mainland, right? So, uh, but in consumer products, that doesn't work so well. But social stuff is the internet. Google knows the internet, so we'll, we'll have to see. I think uh, Facebook is, does so well and they're so entrenched that it's, they're, not, they're, not, they're not, not going away. There. They're not going to give up. They're not going to do a MySpace and no. ignore what Google does, uh, the way uh, MySpace really was oblivious to how well Facebook was doing. Uh, so I think at best, I think where Google will succeed is if Facebook says, you know what, what Google's doing is so important that we have to sit down with them and share some information there. What really drives Google crazy about Facebook is that you've got hundreds of millions of people, sooner or later it's going to be a billion people, creating information that's important to them that Google can't put in its indexes. Google can't right. give its customers when they say, find me something, this. This is important to me. Find it for me. 
Well, and, it's, and Facebook is sort of bringing back display advertising because they have so much information about you that right. they can actually target a display ad. But which, people, you know, that, the, what, that's what Facebook doesn't have. Facebook doesn't have that magical combination that we mm -hmm. talked about earlier in their advertising. I think people would be happier if there were no advertising on Facebook. I, Mark Zuckerberg, I went to that famous session where he talked about you know, how uh, to advertisers, he said, what we're gonna give you is the chance to put yourself in the conversation between our users, and you know, between, you know, between friends. When I talk to my friends, I don't want Pepsi Cola in the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> No, I want Coke. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I think you're right. I mean, it, it's going to be interesting to see how all of this uh, uh, plays out. There is one thing before I get to the questions from the audience, though, that, that does strike me about Larry as he takes the helm, that he, he can be a little arrogant, perhaps. I mean, the, you, you, you quoted someone in the book from Simon and, and Schuster who called it, uh, this was over the, the whole Google Books deal, innocent arrogance. And Larry's sense that, I'm trying to do good. I'm, I'm trying to digitize the world's books. This is good. And yet, I wonder if that's going to get him into trouble, too, this mission to do mm -hmm. good without also realizing that you're going to hit up against right. um, industries that are, I, I, it's not necessarily, I mean, people write books. Those books are valuable. And as you said, Sergey is not really, they don't sort of get it, um, that people have worked hard on books, your book, mm -hmm. for example. And I, you know, it, did you sense that about him? Or, or is that, it came through in the book that that's what you were sensing about well, him. Well, you know, when you write about people like Larry Page or Steve Jobs, sometimes people are tempted to say, there was a lot of writing about Steve Jobs and talked about there's the good Steve and the bad Steve. And you know, there's only one Steve. And, and you can't tease those things out. Mm -hmm. And some of the, the aspects of his personality, which may not be the greatest, uh, are probably some of the reasons why he's the greatest as a CEO. Mm -hmm. And I think the same with Larry. Some of the, the I would say, less arrogance than blinders mm -hmm. to the effects of, of what he does there. So you take something like the books. He knows it's a value to the world to have this corpus of information that anyone could search. And that's important. And so he's so focused on that mm -hmm. that maybe in an intellectual sense he can get the concerns of authors, but when he sees them going up there and, and complaining, uh, and, and he says, he, he says, and that's the sort of way he sees it, uh, you know, he doesn't have much patience for it. Right. And when he talks about the people who talk about privacy, Google's very concerned about privacy, mm -hmm. but a lot of people at Google don't think much of privacy advocates. And, and they'll, they, they think that those people are you know, out playing some angle or something like that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And you know, in a way, that enables Google to charge forward and get things done, but it's not going to help them too much when they're fighting antitrust charges or justifying what they do in a regulatory or legal sense. Yeah, I, that's what I, because as we move forward, that there's going to be more of that as they get bigger and bigger. So let's take some questions. The first okay. one, uh, certainly a good question here. How will Google change after Eric Schmidt leaves? Um, well, he's basically, I mean, this week. Right. Um, yeah, I think you know Larry started as CEO uh, not on April 4th, which was the formal day, but January 20th, which was the day it, it was announced. The, uh, immediately after that, I think Larry started jumped jumped in and you know uh, started rethinking the way Google's managed and uh, stepped things up in, in in certain areas and started rethinking how Google can reclaim its nimbleness. You know, and I think periodically, every so often, Google does that. But in another sense, I think that things won't change so much in that Larry's values were always the values mm -hmm. that drove Google. And people channeled his love of speed and scale and ambition and artificial intelligence. You know, so in, in that sense, I think maybe Google would be more of what it is. It's almost doubling down on Googliness. Doubling down on Googling. Although I did know, I did read some, that this memo that he sent out, he talked about how when people are in meetings, they shouldn't be typing at their computers or anything. And it reminded me that early on, you know, the famous story about um, Barry Diller coming right. to see Larry Page and the entire time Larry was on his Blackberry like this. 
Right. Well, I, I thought that was interesting because at one point they thought that was Maybe one he's of the, grown up. That, that was one of the glories of Google Meetings. Mm -hmm. The idea that, that, that people could you know, you know, do their work and attend the meeting and you know, focus in on just the right time and then you know, like zone out and answer the, the voluminous email that every Googler has to deal with. Yeah. Um, comment on Eric Schmidt's position on Apple board and conflict with Android development. Mm -hmm. There's a lot to comment on that. What would well, be your it was interesting because I was talking to him, you know, uh, interviewing him right around that period there. And at a time when Google was developing Android, Eric would have to leave the room in an uh, Apple board meeting when that happened there. And I explored the Google-Apple relationship there, to some degree there because something went terribly wrong that Steve Jobs apparently came to feel that he had been betrayed, that he had, that Android was not what he thought it was going to be. Right. And that what he had envisioned once as a great pair, you know, Claude Rains and Humphrey Bogart, you know, marching off to, you know, uh, you know rule the digital world, because he thought their companies were entire complementary, entirely complementary, wasn't to be. And he even said to his employees at one point, he said, well, we're not doing a search engine. Why are they doing a phone? And uh, Eric would always tell me, well, it's, 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 it's a, you know, we have it all figured out. You know, and I leave the room. And you know, we're, we're competitors in some ways. Frenemies is a big deal in Silicon Valley. It happens all the time. Mm -hmm. But clearly, there was more going on beneath the surface there to the point where that relationship just got fractured. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they, you know, Steve Jobs was actually kind of mentoring them when they were younger, and they wanted him as CEO. So right, right. And he would betrayal. take walks with Sergey, and, you know, and, right. and, and, so, and, and Steve Jobs is respected super highly at, yeah. at Google. Uh, some of their, uh, Marissa Mayer takes, you know, her, younger managers and, and product managers to the Steve Jobs keynotes to learn how it's done. <laughs> uh, so uh, despite all this, uh, you know, you won't find anyone at Google who doesn't admire Steve Jobs. And, uh, you know, and, and a lot of people, I guess, wish that some of that could find its way uh, to Google. What shocked you the most about Google, hmm. if anything? Did anything shock you? Well, one thing is we talked about the uh, free management style there. Mm -hmm. I, I was not shocked, but surprised at a number of internal systems they have whereby you know, people have to report their goals on a quarterly basis and, and you know, there's a big peer review product. So for a company which uh, cherishes a bottom-up style, there's a lot of paperwork <laughs> that, that they have to do. And, and it, it's done in a, a Google style, but I, I, I find that kind of interesting. And the, the biggest one is this thing at Google called OKRs, and it's something that John Doerr introduced. That it was originally thought of by Andy Grove at Intel, but Google takes it way beyond the way it ever was anywhere else. And everyone has these OKRs, which are these goals they have for the next quarter, for the next year, and sometimes whole divisions of goals, or the, like OKR, or the whole company will have an OKR, and everyone shares those. You can go on the website, the internal website, and see everyone else's OKRs. And you know, uh, they give you a number, and, and later um, you'll report uh, you know, how well you did on your OKR, what percentage you did, you know, what number. And out of a 10, um, if you do 10, that's not too great always, because that shows you weren't ambitious enough. <laughs> you were sandbagging it. So like a, like a six or seven is a good OKR you know, fulfillment at, at, at Google. <laughs> OKR is also one of those terms when you use it, uh, you know, they're, they, they have these whole series of acronyms in Google vernacular. That's another way that people will talk to me more freely if I've mastered the, that vernacular. And you say, like, you know, you set your OKR to GPS, and, you know, can like LSE said, okay, then... They're and, like speaking in yeah, a whole other oh, Google the, He's one of us, hmm. So every company has its flaws. What is Google's, and uh, can it be fixed? Hmm. Well, we, we touched on a couple of them. I think that myopia yeah. in terms of their effect on the world there, I think, is 
definitely something that doesn't uh, serve Google well. Um, I think just its size. It, it, it's, mm -hmm. you know, Google likes to think of itself as David, but there's a lot of Goliath now in the company. Well, I, and I think, I mean, the rumor is that there might be a Justice Department investigation into it, to which um, I should add, and you mentioned this in the book, that Steve Ballmer, the CEO of Microsoft, hates Google and has done everything in his power to, to sort of put out there right. that it is a monopoly. I, I find that so ironic that... <laughs> You know, I, I covered Microsoft and Bill Gates, I mentioned that during that time, mm -hmm. and I, I had some amazing conversations with Bill Gates. And I would say then, at that, at that point, I would have said that this is something that Bill Gates would not wish on his worst enemy. <laughs> <laughs> I take that back. <laughs> So it seems, it's, I think it's Steve Ballmer who's the one who's really, you have a couple reported scenes in there. I, I do know, I can add I, to We can't repeat what, what happened in those scenes on uh, you know, Yeah, on, on TV, <laughs> but, uh, but I do know that when I was up at Microsoft several years ago and I saw Steve Ballmer, and this was before Google had gotten really big, and he said, Google's a nice little company. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, we used to be a nice little company, and then suddenly we were a monopoly. <laughs> and you know, I, I mean, this is what he said to me, so clearly I've, I remember that because as I've watched them move forward. So um, how do you see Google's recent multi-million dollar paths to retain employees affecting morale? Hmm. That's, a, that, that's a great question. There's been reports that uh, to keep some of its key talent, Google's giving remarkably huge sums of, of, of money. And you know, certainly there is a huge competition now for the most talented people in the Valley. And Google hires very talented people, mm -hmm. and they turn out to be good employees of other companies. <laughs> and uh, I think it, it could be a, 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 a big problem there. You know, because yeah. people who come into Google, especially the past few years, they don't get the financial gain that the early Googlers had, right? When you, if you were at Google, in the earlier days, like you know, say pre-IPO, or especially a couple of years before that, you were at a different financial level than even someone who got a very nice package coming in uh, a, a couple mm -hmm. of years ago. Uh, and Google is doing its best to try to retain people, but the big difficulty really isn't how much money you can give to, to, to someone there. It really is the challenge. Google selects people who are likely to get fed up with the bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. So the people, the exact kind of people they look for are the kinds of people who, when a company gets too big or a great opportunity to start a new company comes up, says, I, I'm, I'm out of here. Even, and, they, and I can't tell you how many people who leave Google who say, it's a great company. It's been a great experience. I love the company. See you later. <laughs> well, and you, in the book, you talk about a few key people who left who... Uh, uh, went on to found, for example, Foursquare mm -hmm. uh, because they couldn't get things done within the bureaucracy of Google um, and that being a problem. But does right. it affect how people are feeling there? I mean, do people still feel like, hey, I'm at Google? I think the people really, you know, the, the employees I see, most of them, you know, really like, like being there. Mm -hmm. There are some, a lot of people I talk to, some people who came in a, a couple of years ago, uh, a young engineer will come in and will find himself or herself uh, working at some ad product that may not be the most innovative thing they're doing, and Google has to do this. I talked to Bill Corrin, mm. who's one of the, the, the top executives in engineering, and he says, this is a very difficult thing for us. We have to have people uh, manning these portals. We, you know, the, you know, we, these people have to do these things to keep the, the core of Google going, and I have to sometimes tell people, you're, in, you're doing this when you'd rather be you know, uh, programming the self-driving car or something like that. Yes, the self-driving car. I, I could have used, I, I was hoping, as I said earlier, I was on a, had wished I was on a road of self-driving cars tonight because the traffic was so terrible mm. getting here, but that is, as they move forward, that's a sort of pet interest of Larry's, right, to really do this self-driving car um, and probably a place where, you know, the innovation does continue with, pro with projects like that. Right, I, I found it very encouraging uh, that, that projects like that are still going on. And a lot of people say, self-driving car, what does that have to do with search? Mm -hmm. 
and they think it, it's an example of, of crazy Google going far afield. Though I actually think the, the autonomous car is well in keeping with what Google is. It's an information processing device. It gathers information about the world around it. It draws information from Google's indexes. That car knows what's around the corner because Google maps all, all these things, right? right. Uh, and yeah. it's artificial intelligence. And it's very much in keeping with a lot of Google there. So I think that more and more, Google interprets his mission very, very broadly. But those core elements are very much in keeping with the rest of the company. What is Google's biggest threat? Well, uh, in the short term, I would say it's the social thing and, and Facebook. In the long term, really, it's, it's how much a success, it's great success in this area of, of search and ads stops it from dominating the next thing. It's the, the innovator's dilemma. Um, you could say they had a mini leap to overcome that in the mobile world. That could have been a huge, huge uh, problem for Google. At a certain point in the not terribly distant future, there will be more searches made on mobile devices than there will be on laptops or desktops. And if Google wasn't placed very well in the mobile world, that would have been a giant problem for them. So they managed to leap over that little shift there. You know, it's actually a pretty big shift, but not as big as some other shifts that, that are yet to come. And it's, as Clay Christensen said, it's very difficult for a company that is very, very successful and invested in one area to dominate in the next revolution there. And in a sense, that's what's happening with Facebook. But I think down the road, there's going to be bigger revolutions that Google will be even more challenged to succeed in. Yeah, well, I mean, as we watch what's happening with Microsoft, um, they've had a harder time as the world has changed. In fact, in the book, I think you cite at one point that Bill Gates really didn't even cease the value of search and of a lot of the cloud stuff. Right. He, he really missed it. Right, I, I tell a story. At one point, not long after Gmail came out, uh, Bill Gates visited me in my Newsweek at, at office. It's a uh, great story, yeah, by the way. Yeah, and his, his, his subject, the thing he wanted to talk about, uh, this is uh, 2004, was how spam would be going in a year. Um, <laughs> he's not exactly Nostradamus. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but we finished our conversation. We were sitting in my editor's office. And we were just talking about what products we use and, you know, before he was going on to his next interview. And he saw that we, he had Gmail. I added our Gmail on there. And he was asking about Gmail. And I mentioned that, yeah, I'm about two-thirds filled by the quota of Gmail, the, the, the gigabyte or two gigabytes, what it is. And he was stunned. He said, how can that happen? They must be doing something wrong in how they calculate it. What are you, you know, what is your email, movies? And, you know, he, he, he was very upset. At, at this and you know, kind of the way Google was doing it and things like that. And I think that maybe he was just focusing on the technical issue of how emails were stored, but in a larger sense, the way he saw email was basically there's a limited amount of storage. He, I'm sure Bill Gates intellectually understands how the price of storage has gone down, but he hadn't really internalized it right. in a way where he totally understood down to his bones that storage was free now. And you right. could do something like Gmail, and at a not great cost to your company. Right. And I mean, that's the, there could be that moment in the future for Google where they just, they don't see it. Um, has anyone objectively compared the quality of Google search results today versus a few years ago? Google. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and they tell me it's better. They, they, <laughs> they must know what they're talking about. Um, this is actually a great question. Please comment on the role of speed latency in Google's success. Larry Page is obsessed with speed, right? Right, yes, yes. And as a matter of fact, I think you were going to ask me to read something yes. at, at the end, and I think that, that was what I was going to uh, choose to do. Uh, and I think I'll, I'll, I'll save that one for later, but just let me say it's very, very important for Google. Speed is a feature and a, and a very important one. This is a Curious question, because I just figured it was all a secret. To what extent is Google's formula for success still a secret? Well, uh, when you say it's formula for success, they're not sharing the algorithms. No, but it's harder think, to get than the Coke recipe. But I think the, the, the formula 
well, you can read this book, but <laughs> <laughs> it, it's discoverable, you know, uh, what, what, what it is. There, you know, Google is, to some degree, uh, opaque to the outside. You know, I compare it to a lobster. Internally, everyone shares everything, but there's a, a hard shell to get to know things. But in other respects, they're pretty open. I think in the last couple of years, they've been more open. Things that mm -hmm. used to be called black boxes, they've made an effort to be more com communicative about. And they make little videos that talk about how the ad system works. And uh, if you go to the papers, you can understand you know, things about how the search engine works. And there's even some papers and things about, uh, a couple things about the data centers. So I think that if you're reverse engineering Google, you could learn a lot, as I did, really, about how they've achieved success. Now, duplicating it is another matter. <laughs> well, yeah, the, this, is, this person gave me a triple header, because the next one was, what is it about their formula that other com companies just can't emulate? Uh, well, you know. some of the things they, they can and some they can't. You can't build a, a, a data, a, the infrastructure of data centers from scratch. That takes billions of dollars. Right. There's a lot of innovations that they're not sharing with us that's it's in those, and they have the fiber and these other things. So you know, there's an infrastructure that you can't easily match if you wanted to be the next Google. The, the third question I, I really like, and, and you're going to like this one too, whom would you pick to play Larry and Sergey in a social network type film about Google? <laughs> wow, I'm going to have to you know, you know, rely, rely on my... Uh, <laughs> Not encyclopedic, uh, you know, the steward of, 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 of young actors. You know, you know, someone like Jake Gyllenhaal comes to mind. Maybe he'd be a good, you know. Yeah, I think Jake Gyllenhaal. I'm, I'm trying to think, like, you know, who, who else really? Jake would be good as Larry. Yeah. Sergey, I don't know. We'll, we'll be, you know, Michael Sarah. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, what was the purpose of hiring Vint Cerf from MCI? He hasn't done much politically. Um, is that an ICANN role, an internet figurehead role, or what is the internal thinking there? I guess when you have a chance to hire, in your internet company, you have a chance to hire the father of the internet, you, you take it. And actually, Vint is, uh, I think people rely on him for his wisdom, and I think he's a powerful force He's based in the D.C. area mm -hmm. uh, to talk to policymakers and uh, people who watch Google. In, in that sense, people listen to him. So I think it was a good hire. You know, actually, bringing that up, um, we didn't we didn't talk about the whole Verizon situation. And actually, that's a moment where I suddenly didn't hear him because he had been previously a huge net neutrality advocate. And I think that's one of these places where I think. A lot of people who sort of believed in the don't be evil suddenly got turned around, which is around the issue of network neutrality, that you know, one, one website shouldn't be favored over another. Right. Um, and all of a sudden, Google had this turnaround. What, well, I, what was, I remember, what, I think Vint finally did weigh in on the side of, of his employer. People were sort of wondering, is Vint going to sit this one out? You know, and this is the question from net neutrality. Basically, Google and Verizon together uh, reach the, uh, the idea that we'll have net neutrality, but maybe not so quickly in the mobile sense, that it won't be so new, we won't enforce it so strongly in the mobile, which became uh, what the FCC eventually uh, right. a a adopted uh, in de December when they you know, adopted rules uh, about net neutrality, which are currently being you know, uh, uh, litigated by Verizon, mm -hmm. among others. And uh, that you know, troubled a lot of people. And you, you have to see it to some degree as a business decision. Verizon is a very powerful partner for Android. Yeah, that's where, I mean, that's, uh, you know, going back to this, I mean, can this company continue to grow and really, you know, not be evil? A lot of people felt that this was, in fact, exactly that. It was a, it was a business decision. It wasn't a decision that, in the end, ma that many consumer advocates felt was going to benefit the consumer. It was a good decision for Google, though. I mean, what, so, what's so your So look take at the position it? now that, that Google is in by setting its standards so high. Yeah. <clears throat> people criticize it for making this business decision, right? And yeah, it was a business decision that might be good for Google, but now people expect it to sacrifice profits for humanity. I don't know. 
Um, yeah, no, I, I, think it's, I think it's complex as you get bigger. You know, this, uh, it's a company now that is huge. Um, Google's original mission is to organize the world's information in useful and accessible ways. How strong is that mission inside the company today? I, I think it's pretty strong. A, a lot of people invoke it. And they say, they're explaining this product or that product and say, well, you know, since our mission is to uh, and, you know, organize and you know, or, or gather and organize the, the world's information, make it accessible, this is why this product makes sense. And then, then they'll tie it to that. So I feel that that's pretty much ingrained uh, at Google. And it's a, it, it's a useful mission, a useful focus for them, and one which I think its employees are happy to embrace. Right. It's feel good. Yeah. No, I mean, you know, accessing information, and I, it's a good mission. It is a useful mission. Um, serve them well. Now, here's a question. You know, you've gone from writing about one kind of rock star to another kind of rock star. Um, how did writing for Rolling Stone affect your work on this book? <laughs> we were just talking earlier right, about yeah. how he interviewed Bruce Springsteen as one of his, you know, so how's it to go from Bruce to Larry? Well, um, one of the greatest interviews I ever did, uh, or the greatest quotes I ever got, was when Jerry Garcia told me, technology is the new drugs. And, <laughs> and I think that the excitement, you know, I, I, when I was a, a teenager, the music I listened to was the, this great music of the late 60s. And, mm -hmm. and, and it was, you know, inspiring in, in lots of ways. And I think technology now, to me, and this is why I, I am so, feel so lucky to be writing about it, to have been writing about it, uh, during this, these, these past couple decades, you know, it has the same kind of excitement. It, it's, it's transformative, mm -hmm. it can do a lot of good, it's got, it's got its dark side, as the music did, mm -hmm. but it's an amazingly rich field to, 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 to look at, and uh, the people are more articulate than rock stars. <laughs> there you go. Some of them. <laughs> Some, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes they're not so good at explaining. Well, I actually, I, I, I love talking to the engineers. A lot of times, uh, I'll, I'll, I'm about to go into a meeting with an engineer, and someone will say, yeah, he's pretty much an engineer, you know. And, uh, but but I, I, I like talking to, the, to those people. I, I, and I think I've had some success in learning from them. Well, I want to let you take a moment to read a little section of your book. Sure. And this, this had to do with the, the question about speed and right. how important that is. Right. Okay. So it's about Larry and speed. Speed had always been an obsession at Google, especially for Larry Page. It was almost instinctual for him. He's always measuring everything, says early Googler Megan Smith. At his core, he cares about latency. More, accuracy, more accurately, he despises latency and is always trying to remove it, like Lady Macbeth washing guilt from her hands. Once Smith was walking down the street with him in Morocco when he suddenly dragged her into a random internet cafe with maybe three machines. Immediately, he began timing how long it took web pages to load into a browser there. Whether due to pathological impatience or a dead-on conviction that speed is chronically underestimated as a factor in successful products, Page had been insisting on faster delivery for everything Google from the beginning. The minimalism of Google's home page, allowing for lightning quick loading, was the classic example. But early Google also innovated by storing cached versions of web pages on its own servers for redundancy and speed. Engineers working for Page learned quickly enough of this priority. Quote, when people do demos and they're slow, I'm known to count sometimes, he says. One 1,000, two 1,000. That tends to get people's attention. <laughs> Actually, if your product could be measured in seconds, you'd already failed. Buckheit, Paul Buckheit remembers one time when he was doing an early Gmail demo in Larry's office. Page made a face and told him it was way too slow. Buckheit objected, but Page reiterated his complaint, charging that the reload took at least 600 milliseconds. That's six tenths of a second. Buckheit thought, you can't know that. But when he got back to his own office, he checked the server logs. 600 milliseconds. <laughs> he nailed it, says Buckheit. So I started testing myself. And without too much effort, I could estimate times to 100 milliseconds precision. I could tell if it was 300 milliseconds or 700, whatever. And that happens throughout the company. Well, um, Stephen Levy, there's probably a million more questions I have from the audience and that I have, um, but I guess those 
people with those questions will have to read the book. Okay. Um, which was a great read. So um, thank, thank you, you very Eva. much. Thank you. It was great.